projects and also the projects in Africa who uh, are members of the SNRD uh, working group for organizing this important event. I think contract farming is a worthwhile topic to discuss a little bit more and deeper uh, in, in depth uh, because there has been this uh, huge work piece done on contract farming as a manual, yeah, and applying this manual and these guidelines in uh, project activities, I think it's worthwhile to have stock taking after two or three years to see how that how did it work, uh, what factors would uh, uh, hinder and what would uh, favor uh, integration of smallholders, marginalized smallholders into into value chains, and what are uh, what are the potentials to improve further on the on the contract. Uh, uh, manual. I think uh, it would be also worthwhile to have some kind of a community of practice if it is not already there to, uh, to discuss experiences on implementation of the contract uh, farming manual uh, um, even after the stock taking exercise. Um, contract farming is one of our tools in, uh, that we apply in GLZ uh, to, to develop uh, agricultural value chains. And as the number of projects that we have is quite important in Africa and also beyond Africa, uh, I think it's worthwhile to, to <coughs> look deeper on into the potential of this instrument. It's, it's definitely clear that it's an instrument that's not applicable in all circumstances, but uh, to look uh, a little bit closer, which are the, which are the framework conditions that, uh, that are favorable and conducive to apply this this model that might be worthwhile to, um, to look at. I think most of you are here with us either in the room or online via Skype for Business um, because you already know that it is important or you have been involved in one way or the other in your project work with the instrument and approach and I think one of the objectives of, of objectives of today's meeting is on top of presenting the results as Katarina mentioned and also hearing from the project level is also to get advice from you on how to further pursue conceptually the work of GIZ in contract farming for agricultural value chains as well as picking your experience and, and guidance. Now let me just mention a few points the road we've traveled so far. Um, yesterday I was asked is, is, what's actually new about this contract farming and I said my instant answer was there's nothing new we've been doing and supporting and facilitating that with agricultural value chain projects for quite a while. Um, and I was told, actually, it's not very, um, yeah, it's not so smart to uh, say the topic you're talking about is not very new and not very, um, it doesn't sound very attractive to the audience. So I decided I'll only mention it briefly because there are a couple of things are new. And I think it is important to uh, think about the agricultural world in Africa has changed over the last 15 years enormously. Yeah? African economies have changed and the role of Af agriculture in African economies has changed. Not only because of the food price crisis and uh, 2008 onwards, but also because of more investment going into agriculture and the boom of the natural resources and um, the the potential to market the size of the sheer market has grown because of more investment going into, but also due to population growth, people usually spend money on food, so also the market in itself is growing. So I think it's important for us to see there is big agricultural market opportunity, and in, when supporting agricultural value chains in one of our roughly 700 ongoing agricultural value chain projects, um, we do support inclusive business models, and we try to picture conceptually contract farming as one of these inclusive business models and inclusive here is important because not all business models are favorable to the target groups that we are paid to deliver to yeah i mean um, a lot of contractual arrangements between buyers and sellers are normal business models and they have their um, their place in economic activities but not all of them do fall in line with objectives in development cooperation. And of course, for us, it is always important to look at the add-on, the developmental add-on such uh, arrangements can provide. And in contract farming, we <coughs> summarize this as it has to be inclusive. Now, what have we done? Um, I'm very happy that we have Margaret with us. She's also going to take us all back to where it all started, 
not started, but picked up five years ago when she developed the first handbook. Um, we have copies around here and also uh, put uh, the download in the chat function in a minute so that um, we all know it was popular. People, particularly our colleagues in the projects, demanded for more practical advice. So a volume two was developed with hands-on experiences and there was a high demand and still is for capacity development in building more trainers, capacity of staff in the countries, of partner staff, of extension staff, and so on and so forth. Margaret has been super active in that, and I'm happy that we have you here. Um, last year, um, the sector network rural development, Gerd also mentioned it, met in Pretoria, and there again, the open space session or contract farming generated a lot of interest. And we were once again reminded that we need to do more. Now, how to do more, who needs to do more, what actually was needed to be done more, um, was also then developed with the help of Margaret. We developed an upscaling strategy because we realized by supporting a project in Ghana there or doing something with trainers in Burkina Faso there uh, was not enough. We need a full scaling up strategy because scale is one of the biggest advantages uh, such contract farming arrangements can achieve for development cooperation. We can always do a lot of and implement things with projects ourselves and they will remain small. And contract farming can achieve quite impressive numbers if well managed and, it, and reach out to a number of beneficiaries. So the scaling up strategy had a number of action points. We looked at it last year in August and um, prioritized a handful of action points and one of these was the stock taking we're going to present today. Another one was showcasing more country and project experiences. And lastly, um, what is of urgent need, and probably also to our colleagues joining online from the project, we um, plan to hold master training courses in the second half of this year, two of them, to build more master trainers who could then train more contract farming trainers and advisors in the region. Because we know by now it is important not only to train, according to the GIZ uh, developed handbook, but also to coach and guide not only extension workers and, and, and private sector companies and target group who are working in it over a year, but maybe even longer, because we know it takes time. In 2012-13, um, Kompaki and uh, a project in Zimbabwe were working on contract farming, and they got aware that there is nothing practice-oriented, hands-on uh, available, with regards to uh, an approach, with regards to instruments to um, promote contract farming. And at this point in time, I was asked uh, whether I could give a hand in developing these handbooks. Um, so contract farming, as Heike was saying, is nothing new. But it was more a trial and or error approach in the past. And now, with uh, some uh, hands-on uh, methodological comments with many questions because the first handbook is mainly about questions. How can you approach the promotion of contract farming? And the second volume is about instruments and case studies. The two of them together give some uh, yeah, quite uh, practice-oriented uh, uh, material uh, for projects working on it, but as well, as well for companies interested in promoting <coughs> Uh, contracts with their suppliers and certainly also farmer based organizations already using it. Okay, let's have a look uh, perhaps first at what we are talking about. We are talking about these two handbooks, okay, um, they were published in 2013 and 2015. But what is this methodology about? It's uh, a thinking in business models, therefore, also contract farming as an inclusive business model. And this is the difference in thinking uh, comparing with the situation before. Contract farming as a business model to address some challenges which we all know. Contracts, they may be signed, but who enforces contracts in the partner countries where we are working? This is a big issue. So therefore the term contract often does not reflect the reality uh, since the contracts cannot be enforced. What are the big challenges? Frequent risks of failure are certainly this site selling, site buying. Site selling means, okay, somebody has uh, uh, agreed on a contract, 
but he says to somebody else who offers a, f a few cents more, or who knocks at the door two uh, days before uh, the contract partner will uh, look for and uh, collect the produce. Side buying is the very same. Because you know that prices are very much fluctuating in our countries. And therefore, if a price was concluded in the contract, which is the point of harvest, in the market lower than the contract price, the buyer will also be interested to buy cheaper. So these are uh, issues which are usually at the origin of failure. What are the reasons behind that? It's a weak decision-making on whether I embark on contract farming or not. Gerd Fleischer was saying, it's not the only solution contract farming. There are many other solutions for selling or buying. Yeah? Only if the situation is well analyzed and a real business decision has been taken to do contract farming, it should be done. Underrating of investment needs. We always think, okay, we kick out the intermediaries and the whole thing will become more cheaper. But in contract farming is also transaction costs involved. Yeah? We have to assure uh, extension services for the farmers, we have to collect the harvest, we have to do many things which cost. So we have to know what are the investment needs and they are usually underrated. Weak management of the contract farming scheme. Lack of proximity so that the buyer and the farmers really know each other, perhaps not in person, but the farmers need to have extension stuff, for example, close by, so that they know who is buying <coughs> and that they can communicate also the quality needs and uh, the timing of collection and so on. Low farm productivity, certainly. How can you be competitive with the final product in the end if the production unit costs are too high because the productivity is low? Therefore, there need to be these so-called embedded services, which are about the buyer who is providing extension services, who pre-finances inputs. Uh, and unfavorable framework conditions, uh, infrastructure plays a big role in that one, because it raises, again, the, increases the prices for collection, input distribution, and so on. And it's often also top-down support. What uh, the methodology we developed uh, is uh, looking at how can we develop the solutions together with the farmers and the buyers. Success factors. To cut it very short, certainly economic and social incentives. Win-win for both. Otherwise, they will not stick together, comply to the contract. And trust. Trust is much more important than the contract signed. Without trust, you don't even need to sign a contract. And what uh, somebody in Thailand was saying, uh, a buyer was saying in Thailand, you survive, I survive, this is our interest in this contract. And this is our motivation, our incentive to comply with the contract. So trust between farmers and buyers is key, and trust requires appropriate approaches. And we thought about these appropriate approaches, how can we uh, come to a success story. Required capacities and change of attitudes are necessary, and therefore we were thinking about how can a contract farming scheme look like to be inclusive, to reflect this win-win situation. We look into how can the farming sector be modernized and uh, professionalization of the value chain, the supply chain as the buyers usually refer to. <coughs> this needs these embedded services to build the capacities of the farmers and to support also the change of attitudes of the farmer groups and farmers, including the buyers certainly. They also need capacity development and change of attitudes. Upgrading of services, so it's not only the buyer who's going to provide the, the services, but often they link up with the public exten extension services or with uh, consulting companies that provide, for example, farmer business school trainings. Yeah? They could also be involved in uh, upgrading such uh, contract farming schemes. 
Improvement of framework conditions with regard, particularly, as I said, to uh, infrastructure, but also in Zimbabwe, in Malawi, in Albania, they have developed also policies uh, for promoting contract farming. So this is also a question of promotional policies and uh, strategies for uh, uh, fostering the relationships between uh, farmers and buyers. Now, what is the key um, element of uh, the approach uh, developed uh, by GIZ? CF is this business model, which is at the interface between the supplies of the farmers and the procurement of the company. It's a business model of two who are doing a joint undertaking. Joint venture, I hesitate to say so, because it's not a joint venture in the true sense of the word. Nevertheless, it's a kind of joint undertaking. Oops. Now, we have got the farming systems of producers or the business model of producer organizations. Often, contracts are also signed with uh, producer organizations. And we have got the business model of the buyer. They both have got, they have got their farming systems, they have got their business model. But at the interface between the two of them, is this contract farming business model. This joint undertaking of which I just talked. And what does it involve? Production and uh, supplies of the producers, the procurement strategy of the company, and these embedded services provided by the buyer to the producers. And this is this contract farming business model, which is a joint business with interdependency, and therefore it works because they, they depend on each other. If they don't depend on each other, because there are many other buyers, okay, I don't depend on my buyer, I don't stick to my contract. The other way around also. Um, the dependency of the buyer on the supplies of the farmers, which makes him, uh, which motivates him to really stick to the contract, comply with the contract. What is this dependency? You know, many, many small and medium enterprises, I, I uh, assume in the countries where you are working, that work at 20%, 30% of the installed capacities of the machines, the processors. I know many of them in rice, in sesame, in uh, fruit drying. I know too many who are not using their installed capacities. Therefore, they depend on the farmers to comply with the contract to assure the quality, to assure the volumes, the timeliness of supplies, and so on and so on. This interdependency is one of the secrets why contract farming works in some cases and in others it doesn't work, because we don't know the, the need for collaboration between the two of them. Therefore, we depend on a very good analysis of the situation to identify these points which motivate the two uh, to work together. Because in the end, it's about both investing into this joint undertaking. They mutualize, on the one hand side, the resources they invest and the risks they take. And therefore, it's really important to look at it as a business model to also define management strategies which help them be efficient, reducing costs, improving the performance, being competitive in the market in the end, and managing risks. Now, why uh, are we so interested in uh, contract farming as a business model, as an inclusive business model? There's quite a lot in it to contribute to the SDGs, to the Sustainable Development Goals. But only if the situation is well analyzed, if the business model is well designed, and if it's well managed. So these are preconditions, and the handbooks are providing some uh, uh, assistance, some tools, um, some uh, methodologies uh, to uh, analyze thoroughly to design a business model which is appropriate and to uh, manage such uh, schemes, hopefully, with success. Now, 
this was where, just to introduce uh, you a little bit to 250 pages of the two handbooks, uh, just to have an idea before we go for uh, the stock taking results. So what is the way forward for scaling up? Before starting that, we should look at what has been done so far. So we have got uh, two partners, let's say, in uh, the activities which have been done since 2013. We have got the programs in the partner countries and we have got the very active sector projects here in, the, uh, in, in, in Bonn nowadays. In the partner countries, um, two uh, departments are involved with their programs in partner countries, which is rural development, agriculture and economic development, employment. We will have two case examples today. From Malawi, it will be uh, economic development, employment, and from Tunisia, the example is from the rural development, agriculture department. We've got many diverse project types which adopted the contract farming approach, which are the so-called bilateral programs. Regional projects like Kampaki, Kari uh, and uh, others and uh, certainly the innovation centers have picked it up and quite a lot of developed projects and also the um, technical, uh, vocational, education and training projects. Some 40 trainings of practitioners, trainers and consultants, coaches have been realized since uh, 2013 and uh, consultancies and coaching of uh, business models, contract farming business models are ongoing in several countries. Uh, the two sector projects in close collaboration with the SNRD, Agribusiness and Inclusive Value Chain Development uh, Working Group, they uh, drafted this concept for scaling up um, one year ago. It's only a draft because we needed more information to uh, be more practice oriented, more oriented where, uh, towards the needs of the programs and therefore there was a survey done last year, uh, a questionnaire answered by 37 bilateral um, regional global GIZ projects and programs in 23 African countries, 12 Asian countries and two from Southeast Europe. And um, in the survey we were especially asking about um, what are you already doing with regard to contract farming and what are your needs for support in the future. And the stock taking in addition to that was looking into uh, the current use of the uh, GIZ methodology. Uh, the results in brief, there are quite some opportunities for uh, promoting contract farming as an inclusive business. According to the survey, the demand is uh, on the rise. And uh, they also say if well planned and well managed, uh, contract farming can be a suitable business concept amongst other inclusive business models. We also always have to stress, contract farming is not a blue ball uh, golden bullet. Or what do you say? Silver bullet, not a golden bullet, not a silver bullet. There are many other solutions. It needs to be well analyzed whether contract farming can serve us in a certain context. Challenges in promoting contract farming as inclusive business model. It's very complex. Contract farming is extremely complex. It's not easy to promote contract farming. Meeting indicators. Okay, we have got very ambitious indicators nowadays. Yeah? Um, it needs a very well uh, conceptualized approach to really use contract farming also to reach out, to scale up, to reach many farmers. It's also a question looking at uh, the complexity of contract farming, grasping these, this methodology which tries to reduce the complexity to something you can use and apply, but grasping also the business sense behind is for many people, like me, consultants, like project staff, it's not our thinking business, normally, to be honest. Yeah? Therefore, to be able to talk, to speak with entrepreneurs, um, it needs also a good digestion, let's say so, of uh, this methodology proposed. 
And then it needs heaps, and we will see it from our case examples, especially Malawi will also look into that. It needs quite a lot of development of capacities. And therefore also the time and resources which are sufficient to accompany contract farming schemes until they break even and they are sustainable. Results in brief. Um, the survey results mid-2017, uh, okay, the demand for trainings, um, basic trainings, about 1,500 persons at this point in time, we were told uh, so many, uh, 1,500 persons have to be trained, just in the basic training, and then uh, 250 people are uh, needed uh, for assuring the trainings, and uh, especially coaching and consulting contract farming schemes. Support required, specific topics, they say we still need to better understand what is this contract farming business model, what is contract farming management, what is financing, especially Jens is uh, just looking for coffee. Financing is a very important issue in contract farming. Documentation of success and failure stories, sharing of good practices and scalable practices, compilation of methods, new tools, materials, country-specific cases. As Heike was saying in the beginning, no, I think uh, Gerd Fleischer was saying so, it, we just have got a few tools for the time being. Many more have to be developed and have already been developed also in some of the projects. But we have to uh, still um, revise them and um, make them available to uh, all the practitioners. Support required. This is about the community of practice uh, Katharina is going to speak about later on. Support is required. And not only once, but continuously. Question answer services and backstopping, linking with experts and or funding opportunities, management of expert pools, regular information, newsletters, webinars, virtual ex exchange, but also, everybody is also saying personal exchange, so looking into regional networks, whether regional ne networks could be established, <coughs> organization of joint trainings, refresher courses, study tours. There's a huge demand for support. Thank you very much, Margaret, for this um, insight into the GIZ approach on contract farming and also presenting the first um, results of the stock taking. I will continue here because uh, these are results which, um, um, uh, which are directly addressed to GIZ. So meaning what can we do here at GIZ? First of all, um, the projects and the programs but also here at GIZ headquarters, especially the, um, the sector projects which are involved. So um, the stock taking pointed out that there is um, on program and project level in the different, in the partner countries, the need to develop uh, capacity, not only on GIZ side, but also um, of the partner stuff in order to be able to um, support planning and supervising of uh, the C CF um, projects. Further, um, there is a huge need, and we heard that again and again, not only in the stock taking, to establish a pool of national and regional trainers and consultants and coaches. I will first, there are already concrete plannings for that. I will talk about that on the next slide. Um, Another recommendation was also to combine contract farming with other approaches or with other training modules. For example, the Pharma Business School or um, a training module on, um, on the business orientation of pharma-based organization or for example, the SME Business Loop, but there are also other, tra other um, um, training modules which might be complementary to um, contract farming. Um, another point is to support um, national and regional expert networks for peer learning. We have made quite good experiences uh, with that in Francophone West Africa. Burkina Faso and Benin um, are two countries, countries which are um, actively exchanging and sharing experiences and um, this is really an added value to see um, how, um, what, are the, what the experiences are, maybe in the neighbor countries but also other countries. 
And last but not least, it is recommended to collaborate also with other organizations, donor um, programs, um, who are interested in GIZ, um, in the GIZ contract farming product. The action points for the two sector projects here at GIZ headquarters in Bonn. It was recommended that this is establishment of uh, a pool of international e experts is uh, is supported. Heike already said in the be beginning that uh, we are planning to do that. I will talk about that on the next slide. Um, we are also, or it was recommended to facilitate the re revision of existing or development um, of, of or the development of new materials. There are also plans for that. Um, the, we have this handbook for contract farming that might be, which is already a couple of years old. There's a need to, to um, work on a new version of it or make it, uh, um, work on a, a shorter version of this quite huge handbook. Um, we should also support programs and projects in developing concepts for inclusive uh, contract farming. So this conceptual onward development, projects and programs um, which are implementing uh, contract farming should be backstopped. And the last point, we have a community of practice on um, contract farming, which moved from the global campus to the EDA platform. This is unfortunately only accessible for GIZ stuff, but nevertheless, we uh, it should be used um, to facilitate an um, an exchange among our colleagues interested and in engaging in contract farming. So here, I would all uh, invite you once again, uh, those who can, to join this platform, and uh, it's good for for sharing um, for sharing documents and uh, information. So let me give you a brief outlook on the next steps that we have planned. Um, we are first of all um, engaging in the sensitization of projects and partner countries. We will first of all, or we have already started with that on the EDA platform to disseminate the stock taking uh, report as well as the fact sheets um, in order to sensitize the projects and partner organizations, we are already, as I said before, um, relaunching the community of practice. The next important step will be the establishment of uh, a pool of international um, and regional master coaches and consultants. Uh, we will start by the, the end of the year with the training of trainers um, of international experts here in Germany followed by um, two uh, trainings of uh, regional master trainers in Africa, one in Francophone Africa and another one in um, Anglophone Africa. Uh, you see screenshots of our fact sheets. We have four, um, one for Ghana on the local rice production. It's mainly um, on um, an example of the CARI, the Competitive African Rice Initiative. Um, program. We have another one on Tanzania, also a curry um, example, also on, on rice. Um, then in Benin, uh, the fact sheet is about the poultry, poultry sector, <coughs> professionalizing farmers through embedded services. And the last one is from Tunisia on, on date exporters. So these fact sheets should serve to inform especially GIZ programs, but also um, BMZ on what is going on in, in contract farming. So with that, um, I would like to close here. And I would like di um, to, to hand over directly to Dr. Martin Baumgart. As I said in the beginning, a consultant who is joining us via Skype for Business um, um, from Burkina Faso. He um, has worked on the stock taking report. He has done um, the case studies for the um, for the French speaking countries. And um, Dr. Baumgart, I would like to ask you to um, if you have any further contributions, comments, or something you would like to highlight here, to um, to contribute that now. According to the results of the of the stock taking report. 
where I was happy to participate. Uh, I think another very challenge is to change from top down to bottom up approaches, placing uh, the high demand on coaching skills. I think this coaching skills is uh, the, the most uh, demanded um, challenge we have to face it. And um, the coaching has to ensure that the farmers and buyers in the contract parties really own their contract farming business models. And I think with all the programs, which, which with all the challenges the, the project and programs are facing nowadays, with the ambitious indicators, with the uh, demanding and uh, rapid scaling up in ever shorter periods of support and time, I think this is something which I, I like to uh, emphasize at this point. Uh, that that there uh, is sufficient support for facilitating trust building between the contract farming business partners. Because as Mark, Mark also said, it is as it is about trust building between the partners, which helps to sustain also contract farming schemes even in rough and difficult times. And I think some most of our partner countries are facing also unexpected difficult times. Maybe at this point I like only to mention this part uh, and uh, I invite everyone to read the, the report which is quite an interesting um, and uh, challenging and, um, work and I think and very interesting also to read. Talking about experiences, recommendation, but also needs for support in uh, implementing the CF approach uh, in our partner countries. We have Neil Furati with us. My presentation is about the experience of contract farming implementation in Tunisia. And uh, it happened between 2016 and now. Uh, and the presentation is about first the, how uh, the approach of the project called IPFA, uh, Initiative for la Promotion des Filières Agricoles, Initiative for the Promotion of Agricultural Value Chains. The second part is about cases, three cases, about three value chains. And the third part is about lessons learned from this, these experiences. Um, the objective of IPFA is to promote the development of sustainable and inclusive business models. The objective is to um, promote and implement business models with, between farmer organization and processing SMEs in Tunisia. It's composed of three parts. The first is three axes. The first is about advices and advice and support on investment promotion and sustainable business model development. The second part is about the implementation of concrete business models that we call pilot projects. And the third part is to try to scale up uh, success of lesson learned and to try to spread this lesson learned. The, the project takes place in the northwest in central west, central west of Tunisia, it's agricultural region. It's it faces different problems. It's um, it has investment in agriculture is low, and uh, all businesses are weak, and especially farmer organizations are very small and. Uh, and we so the, the project has is involved in this different in this context, but still we identified twelve pilot projects, so business concrete business models to implement in and we identified it with local committees composed of financial services and public uh, also public services involved. I mean the partner, especially uh, Ministry of Agriculture. Ministry of Agriculture, and it's, uh, it concerns different farmer organization, which has two forms in Tunisia. The first is SMSI, it's small cooperatives, and uh, and the second part is small association of farmers, it's called PDA. The project, the approach of the project is to try to 
make the actual and existing business models into more sustainable business models. And the steps between this actual and the sustainable business models go through also steps to find financial uh, means to make it more sustainable. So contract farming is for us was for us a way to implement value chain financing and test new value chain financing products. Mm -hmm. The specific challenges that the project had here to to to, to reach the, the, the objective is that the pilot projects in the concrete business models are led by our organization are uh, doesn't have so many business skills and uh, not organize them as an established market. The, that the different organization, farmer organization, are new and are not, um, not uh, so much uh, in a trust based and proven related in trust based and proven relationship with their members and purchasing company. That also the different types of business models required for specific needs of low value chains. There are 12 pilot projects, it's 12 different business models and also different uh, local value chains. And the, the fourth um, challenge is to, there is low know-how about contract farming about far, uh, among farmer organizations, SMEs and service providers. On the other hand, we know that the approach required um, to begin to start the approach from the market side to select the producers according to um, procurement needs and supply chain management cost buyers. It also needs local available good advisory and financial services and good business and investment climate. And first and um, last but very important part that Margaret mentioned is the climate of trust, which is the most important factor for the success of contract farming. So the different phases of the IPFA project for coaching the pilot, uh, this business models where there are three phases. First is assessment phase, the second is business development, business model development phase, and the third is the implementation of the business model. So the assessment is composed of different activities. We assess the contract farming, the different stakeholders of the two stakeholders of the contract farming, which are um, farm organization from one side and on the other side, the SME, processing SME. Uh, um, so we, we assessed both sides in terms of capacity needs and services, the capacity development needs and service needs. We did a um, quick analysis of local value chain, also an assessment of environmental and social uh, situation of the environment of these different stakeholders. And um, we developed an initial contract farming business model and contract farming management system. And the GIZ tools used for this is um, a rapid contract farming scheme assessment, the inventory of preconditions of contract farming, the value chain mapping through value links methods, contract farming and the contract farming risk profile. And we used the, the, business, the business model Canva and very important, the S, um, SME diagnostic method. So then we went to the second phase. The second phase is we had to decide based on this assessment if we go or not go into this coaching pilot project. So the um, this decision was based on economic, environmental, and social uh, potential impact of the business model development. So, because it has to be, be the most 
sustainable in the different way of uh, sustainability, so environmental, social, and economic. And uh, then we decided to go up go. Then we had to exchange with stakeholders on how to improve their situation and how to upgrade the actual business model. So it's a state where we had a lot of uh, meetings and workshops and to understand better the stakeholders' needs and objectives. And we had to develop a risk management system, cost-benefit analysis, and to elaborate business plan and investment plan. The GIZ tools that we used are risk management, introduction to negotiation and contracting, developing and negotiation, negotiating pricing formulas, and we developed through that the strat strategic development plans for uh, mostly for the farmer um, organization and also business and investment plans for especially for the SMEs. Then we to implement the project, uh, the pilot projects, through uh, with different activities. So with consulting for setup and operation of the pilot track farming business models, and second we have to support their the stakeholders to accompany them to get some to get if needed funding credits and also grants that we can have here in Tunisia. So the GIZ tools used are uh, contract farming facilitation and contact farming management and capacity development. So we see that the different phases we did, we use different parts and the uh, component of the contract farming. So now we go through the some examples of a pilot project and contract farming and to try to show the different cases through different value chains and different contexts. First, we, uh, we talk, uh, I will talk about contract farming as a tool to boost turnover and investment. It's about the dry tomatoes uh, value chain, which is a small value chain that with the potential the market in uh, demand for uh, exportation group. Uh, the, we worked with an SME called UFR in Janduba, which is the extreme northwest of Tunisia, not far from the Algerian border. And this SME wanted to have this market and demand from a factory in Italy. But it didn't have enough farmers with her with the company to 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 provide uh, tomatoes with from a specific variety and with specific quality. So from 2016 to now, it we had we thanks to contract farming facilitation. Uh, it enhanced the it. Uh, increase the number of farmers involved in linked to this SME and it helped the SME to get credits for their own investment to be able to reach the export and uh, to satisfy the demand of these factories. And how it, we got this is well with a contract farm show that uh, attracted some farmers thanks to uh, uh, a link, I mean, facilitation of technical advices from the SME. So the farmers benefited from support, technical support from the SME, and also financial support. So it's here it's um, also value chain financing, financial support to buy. Uh, Plants, small plants, uh, yeah, uh, from nursery, and also to to buy uh, uh, inputs. So, so it's a campaign. A campaign um, uh, I mean, credit for so internal value chain financing model. Okay. okay. So it uh, the contract farming. Uh, um, 
facilitation had to 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 the the SME to invest and to increase their the export of uh, uh, dried tomatoes. The second case was about olive oil. The problem or the issue was that a company invested in olive oil conditioning unit to put olive oil in bottles, but it didn't have enough farmers that um, produced this specific olive organic olive oil. <coughs> so contract farming facilitation through the olive oil meal and the association of small farmers had the farmers to get services from the association and financial support from the olive oil meal. So this contract farming is a, here is a tool to support access to international markets. The third case is about dates by chain and it, invo it uh, involves a very big company. So it's different than the two other cases. This very big company uh, needed um, advices to organize their, its suppliers to meet uh, requirements to meet their the requirements of the different uh, legal um, uh, I mean like uh, how it's called uh, organic fair trade global gap so it's it's it, uh, the company needed the farmers to respect these standards and to, I mean, to uh, yeah, to respect these standards. Uh, so the contract farming facilitation helped uh, this company to create a network in um, of and to organize the the, the production and the, the link with the the farmers. Uh, um, through uh, the, the small association, the farmers, small association farmers, and and uh, through also the aggregation centers. So aggregation centers are linked to the association, and the association gave some technical and financial support to the small farmers. The company, big company, had also. Um, specific link with big farmers and direct uh, link with big farmers. This is the of, uh, business models of date value chain. Now I get, I'm going to present a lesson from these uh, experiences. The good practices are of a good practices. The practices that we consider as good uh, as the market told, I told us not bad is uh, that uh, the, um, we um, um, we had business oriented approach and we customized as tools to our specific uh, uh, experiences and models. We integrated financial services providers and non financial providers in the beginning of the process and even since the the first contact with the, uh, the, the, the stakeholders of the business models. We fixed specific, um, criteria for the selection of beneficiaries and we, um, uh, we did to as much as possible to develop an approach that where we used two facilitators, one from the farm side and one from the, the SME side. So the lesson learned is the most successful cases are when we promote existing market linkages and we promote uh, emerging SMEs aiming to extend uh, their activities. Uh, since each case is specific, contract farming business models are not replicable and every case has to be well analyzed to develop appropriate solution. And, uh, or win-win situation. The third lesson is that we need to sensitize farmer, sensitize farmer organization, explain what is contract farming to farmer organization and its objective, and we especially uh, have to explain 
try to make this farmer organization, organization able to take risks with the SMEs. Risks have to be taken from both sides. We have to, to improve capacity building of farmers and organization, organizational development of their groups. And the selection of farmers and farmer groups has to be done, uh, should be oriented by the procurement needs and management capacities of the SMEs and should be done by contract farming agencies of public partners. The setting up of an inclusive contract farming business model is a medium-term project, so it takes time and resources. So it's, our project is short, but and we need two, three, four uh, campaign to improve each time the, the business model and to adjust the different contract farming uh, processes and agreements. So the more we take time and follow up this small project and business model, the more we have chance to make it succeed and uh, reach the effective fix that we did. It was very uh, interesting and it's especially the recommendations at the end uh, confirm once again the ideas that we already had for, um, have for scaling up uh, the contract farming approach. So I would like to ask um, Paul Kronjäger to start with this, his presentation on the experiences in Malawi. I think this is quite interesting. Um, um, you haven't worked that much uh, with the, the CF approach in uh, the GIZ CF approach in Malawi yet. So you have also um, other models, and so I think this is uh, a different insight compared to to um, Tunisia. So the floor is yours. I work in Malawi in the uh, Kulima More Income and employment in rural areas of Malawi program, which is a bilateral program in the sector, um, private sector development. So we'll just briefly go into um, contract farming in Malawi more generally and then how we support uh, contract farming as an inclusive business model. And then way forward, uh, and way forward I'll focus on our idea on what we call an inclusive business advisory facility which links nicely to the plans uh, for scaling up contract farming developed here in headquarters. Um, so Malawi often is confused with Mali, that's why I put uh, Malawi <laughs> here. It's a rather small but highly densely populated country in southeastern Africa and, and it is one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, its most important export good, which is interesting for us also, is tobacco. And tobacco is usually uh, farmed in a contract farming arrangement. So that's quite interesting. Tea and sugarcane are very important too, and they're also very important in contract farming. Um, so contract farming in Malawi has existed for many decades, especially in uh, export-oriented crops such as tobacco, sugarcane, tea, and cotton. And these are as we call them sometimes more closed or structured markets. So there are only a few bigger players. There's a structured way of marketing these crops. It's not like maize, which is marketed in every single rural market between farmers, small traders, medium traders, and so on. So there are quite um, well structured marketing channel, channels for, for um, these crops. For instance, tobacco has to be marketed through the auction flows in the army. Um, these uh, established schemes usually target more the, let's say, medium farmers rather than the, the bottom of the pyramid, uh, smallholder farmers. And often they include inputs into their input packages um, for food crops also. That has been one way to, to avoid the use of fertilizer for, not for the crops it's intended for, but for instance for maize, which many farmers did. However, many of these uh, schemes maybe we cannot really consider inclusive contract farming because, well, they don't really always lead to higher prices uh, for the farmers and child labor is something highly prevalent. Uh, there was just a Guardian article about it, about tobacco farming in Malawi. Um, so how to make these contract farming arrangements inclusive is a big question for us. Um, small and medium scale enterprises like smaller processing plants, rice mills and so on also have more uh, informal contract farming arrangements are also an interesting starting point perhaps for more support coming from project, projects like ours. 
Um, very short background of what we do, our program. We try to link um, larger off-takers, agro-industrial companies, more directly to farmers, and that sometimes we, we support this more direct marketing links through commodity exchanges, but also through uh, contract farming arrangements. Um, so we have, yeah, the, the objective of the program is very chain integration of the target group, departing from market opportunities. So only where there is a market opportunity already established, do we start uh, supporting a company, for instance. Um, we have three components. First is the, the promotion of these inclusive business models, very much linked to our second component, strengthening uh, service provision. Usually, as part of inclusive business models, there, is, there are embedded services like inputs, extensions, and so forth. Uh, the third component is more, let's say, bottom-up, where we directly work with farmer organizations or individual farmers in terms of ease strengthening their business uh, capacities and management skills and also try to trying to strengthen their um, negotiation or capacity for instance when they then work with the companies. Um, we work along the whole value chain in close collaboration with the Global Project the Green Innovation Center. Um, so this is sort of the instrument mix of our program. We do where do I put the point of me? Um, so we work directly with, with the component, companies on the inclusive business models uh, through development advisors, integrated experts, short-term consultants, trainings, and so on. Um, the Green Innovation Center is working on good agricultural practices. They um, disseminate innovations jointly. We are doing farmer business schools, um, and we're starting now to do more of a long-term coaching and training cycle for pharma groups, which is called the FO training coaching cycle. Uh, and we also capacitate field officers of partner organizations. So this is more the general mix of how MIRA and Green Innovation Centers together um, support these inclusive business models. And I will explain this um, using the example of a company called Exactus Africa, which is a um, company from the UK and they have a sort of um, CSR vision, they like social, they want to be a social enterprise, um, their mission is, I have to look it up, to be the leaders in sustainable and innovative agriculture in Malawi and provide opportunities for farming communities. So they don't just have a profit interest, but they have inbuilt this social responsibility angle also. Um, they farm they have like 14 big farms in Malawi, we work with about 20,000 farmers. It's part, partly on the farm is in growers, as they call it, partly around the farms is out growers or contract farmers uh, in Groundhouse, Chile, and Paprika. And they, they work from seed production, so from inputs to processing <coughs> groundnuts into, for instance, um, therapeutic food for malnutrition, and then they export that to the regional market, they also export other ground nuts or chili paprika products to the world market. So they're active in the whole value chain and have, a, have an outgrower scheme which uh, needed support. So they approached us uh, about being supported to improve these operations. I'm going to look into how we are supporting Exagris. First of all, we have placed a uh, SIM expert, an integrated expert with the company. Um, who will, has only arrived like a half a year ago, so hasn't had the chance to, to change a whole lot, but is uh, getting kickstarted now, and she works on this contract farming scheme that they have. And the, they also have a, another scheme at the site, which they call the Development Services Unit, which looks more at um, yeah, promoting development, community development, um, within the, the, the communities around their estates. So this is more their social enterprise angle, but it's, it's been, they have two schemes, they do a little bit different things, a little bit the same things in contract farming, and um, the integrated expert is supporting them to kind of yeah, integrate it into one more viable model. Um, she gets some more support. We had hired a consultant to develop a new outgoer strategy, have a new document doing that. We have also worked with Margaret. She was in Malawi and did an assessment, a rapid assessment, let's say, um, with our partners. Exactly, this was one of them. Um, 
on what they should prioritize on. Perhaps she also trained two of the field officers in Nairobi in the contract farming training, and we have also applied some of the tools from the methodology, such as the business model canvas and the contract farming costing tool to look at how much this model would cost. Now it's all been a little bit scattered. This kind of support, we've also started FPS with uh, 7,000 Exagos farmers, I think, last year. Um, and now this is interesting, now we're starting a new, because we, we've realized, okay, this is a bit scattered and doesn't really come together yet. We really need to look at the bigger picture. Every scheme needs its own sort of assessment and um, a long-term coaching. I think everyone has mentioned that. So we now hired another local consulting company to support our integrated experts, expert in a, now a half-year consultancy, maybe longer, to really work on the general model. How are we going to manage it? How, how do we cost it? What is our business case? Um, which farmers do we have to target in order to get the volumes we need to make it a business case? To kind of really make this business case work first before we can go into offering community development services, which are nice to have, but sh coming from a business of um, sort of lens, you need to maybe do that first, have the business case. Otherwise, it's just uh, yeah, something that maybe donors like to support, but it's not really sustainable and doesn't really have any yeah, impact on, on the farmers. Um, the FO cycle is also starting this year, so Exagris uh, is targeting, the, the farmers that Exagris is already working with will be part of this FO cycle, so they will get a long-term one-year coaching. So we try to really integrate the bottom-up and sort of top-down um, support that we that we implement with one company. Um, and lastly, also, um, from the Green Innovation Center side, Exagus will be supported with uh, training on good agricultural practices, innovations such as inoculant in the case of groundnuts or aflatoxin management practices and so on. So this is the instrument mixed as it is, which is um, organized in, not in a develop project, but in a, what we call IDPP, Integrated Development Partnership with the Private Sector. It's like an MOU where um, you kind of formalize which contributions have to come from the private sector partner and what comes from us and what's the long-term also sustainability plan and exit strategy and so on. <coughs> so that's the arrangement. However, there are a lot of challenges, not uh, typical to this model, and then some more general challenges. First of all, Exagris has these two sort of um, schemes at the same time. One is more geared at CSR, um, integration of close by communities as a source of labor, and this doesn't really have a business case yet. And the Exagris Outcrow program, on the other hand, um, which we would like to support and also integrated expert says should come first, that only um, yeah, kind of comes second so far. Uh, but that's the one that probably should come first, um, make some money, and then you can spend that money on CSR and make it inclusive. Well, do it at the same time, but there needs to be a business case. Um, but what's, what's interesting here is that this development services unit is supported by five donor projects from DFID to USA to GRZ. So Malawi is overcrowded by donors and they all scramble for the same five companies to support. So it's much easier for companies sometimes to go to a donor and say, please give me money to do food security projects or um, something, HIV AIDS um, trainings, um, then actually go get some financing at the bank. And that's not sustainable and since we don't, don't want to be doing the same mistake, we are supporting an integrated expert who has the company's interests in mind and who really wants to build a business case. So the challenges really are that often the do um, yeah, you have to see, is it really donor driven or is it a private sector interest that, that is being um, supported here. Then we have the typical challenges, side selling by farmers, side buying by the company. The company's liquidity constraints are a big issue, so they have only set aside a, one amount of money for, for this whole development services unit, and that's certainly not enough to run the scheme uh, as a business yet. But, so they're, okay, I need to be fast, but I'll 
Anyway, so financing, big problem. Um, <laughs> <sorry. laughs> Neil said a short project time frame was the need to, uh, to really support these, uh, these schemes long term. Um, yeah, so another way forward really for Exagris for this certain example is that um, we want to create one model based of the two that they have now integrating the embedded services, input provision, the business model, um, and then also the community development services um, and have one good management system really look uh, as the colleague from West Africa said it, now how to make this actually work, how to cost it, who manages how the, the field officers and all these kind of questions. Um, there are some further challenges, however, really um, how to achieve company commitment is a big question in Malawi where we have an overcrowding of donors. Um, also then the same old companies get supported by so many donors that there are really some market distortions probably. Uh, the whole market is already distorted by food aid and now we come in supporting the few companies we have so it's really yeah, this is maybe more of a general question to, the, to everyone. Um, the tension between really having to tailor support to a company and then having a methodology which is supposed to work for everyone, how to balance that, it's also highly time consuming to work with these partners and we need to make sure that we don't do everything for them and just be like, yeah, we can finance this training and that training and this and that. So what is really the, the company um, contribution also? Um, okay, I'll skip this one. So the way forward for Malawi, um, this is the last slide, we'll also do a local stock taking and we're yeah, looking at in the different value chains, in the different schemes that exist, what has already worked so far locally and how can we repli replicate this, what are the key conditions for contract farming to work in Malawi. Um, we already had an inclusive business workshop a year ago and we'll have a second follow-up workshop this September. Um, trying to get as many private sector people as possible together to discuss um, yeah, the way forward, what do they need uh, in order to build inclusive contract farming schemes. And then really our big idea currently is to then um, start or develop uh, what we call now the inclusive business advisory facility, sort of a hub for knowledge management where all these the stock taking is gathered and then which can more quickly than us um, deliver support to partners as they need it. And that links well then uh, with all the ideas of having master trainers, having regional trainers who are well versed in these um, methodologies and who can be then quickly deployed sort of to partners. Um, so this will be implemented now by a consultancy firm, so outsourcing our work. Um, but we hope also that uh, it's administratively then it can be quicker, uh, the reaction to what companies need um, and also what the farmers need. Um, lastly, this all links nicely now to many uh, GIZ work streams. First of all, of course, um, the contract farming methodology um, we've been talking about here, but also some other work streams within GIZ like uh, the Inclusive Business Action Network, the private sector development, sector projects, um, contract farming community of practice, but also agri-finance projects like GV Akfin, maybe even KFW because we've seen that financing needs are a big issue also in many contract farming schemes. So since we can always work on our relationship with KFW, maybe that's something. Uh, impact investors also came up um, as an interesting link. Yeah, generally now we want to would like to get all your support in uh, backstopping our inclusive business advisory facility, which could also maybe be a model which we develop locally, which can then be replicated in other regions or countries. Also, your presentation once uh, confirmed once again um, the draft of the upscaling strategy that we have. Uh, I think it's uh, you pointed out the need for scaling up, but also um, I found it very interesting that you um, combine different <coughs> training approaches with um, the FO cycle that you have, um, and also um, yeah, different modules and see how they can complement each other. I think that's uh, very done very well in Malawi. 
in your integrated development partnership with the private sector and um, also I think it's interesting that you are also working with other donors that was also a clear recommendation other donors and other organizations on on contract farming. 